I want to ask about a, a different level of gang intervention, if you will. Um, I'm thinking about our political parties <laughs> <laughs> and the, the international gangs that are, you know, called governments and things like that. It, what can we learn about the big, you know, from your work, what can we learn to apply to the big gangs, to those, to those gangs? <laughs> well, something that was said earlier about, you know, victims and perpetrators, and suddenly you start to see differently that, uh, you know, I think it's about health in the end, and once it's about health, then, I think it's a different ball game. I, like, so there you have this image of, of Jimmy Carter who fell in his living room and has a, a black eye this size, but I'm getting on a plane and flying to wherever, Nashville, because there he is building a house for Habitat for Humanity. It's an image. And then you try to imagine, with all due respect, <laughs> you know, uh, our current president, you know, in jeans, hammering, no, it's unimaginable. Even if, even if you voted for him, it's unimaginable. <laughs> but then you have a, a you, know, a, you know, a tweet that calls somebody a loser or the FBI scum or whatever it is. Choose a day, you know. <laughs> And then you try to imagine Jimmy Carter sending a text or calling anybody that. You just try, this isn't a political thing. It's just like, what is that? And people would say, well, he's a good and decent guy. Yeah, not so much. But it doesn't, it's not very helpful. You, it feels more whole to say health and not so much. And then all of a sudden you go, Oh, how do we help each other move towards health? And, and I think that's, I don't, I don't believe in good guys or bad guys. And mainly because I've never met one. And you'd think I might have, <laughs> you know? They're probably telling you that's a bad guy there until you meet them, right? Yeah, and you can't demonize people you know, and so that always happens where I'll work with my enemy, but I'm not gonna talk to him. And that bothered me in my early years, until you know how this works. You know, uh, Richard Rohr says that women work things out face to face, and men work things out shoulder to shoulder. Well, that's kind of my experience, mm -hmm. you know? Homegirl Cafe, you know, it's, Look, bitch, remember that time? You know, they're, they're going to work it out. <laughs> but the guys can be in the bakery making croissants with people they used to shoot at, and they're not going to talk it out. They're just not going to. But I don't know how you, how you figure. They become friends. There was a guy, they were both making croissants at the bakery, and one guy had a very alarming, lots of tattoos, but one really alarming, it was the tattoo of this guy's neighborhood, his enemy, just so that he could tattoo crossing it out on his face. Whoa, here's provocative, here's that. <laughs> really provocative. And they stood next to each other making croissants and they didn't speak. And, and their hatred was personal until this guy David with the alarming tattoo on his day off went into our tattoo removal and he says, I want to take this off. And the next day he was at work. Again, they're not speaking. They're making croissants. <laughs> Until finally David said, I, I got my first treatment yesterday. It's because of you. You're good people. And they went back to croissants. They, don't, <laughs> they didn't have to do chapter and verse, you know. <laughs> but it's like we're all in the march towards what is more integrated, what is healthier. But the minute we get into good and bad and victim-perpetrator, any kind of division you want to, to suggest, I think 
you know, health is a kind of a, a, a saner way to approach it. That how do we help each other move towards the more spacious, expansive, loving thing? Rather than say, he's a decent, good guy because he's building a house and he not so much. It's not very helpful. But how do we get people uh, to move closer to the truth of who they are? Hmm. But it, I don't know what your experience is, but I've never given a talk in the last three years where you don't get a Trump question. <laughs> don't you? Of course. of course. Always. And I'm not good at answering it, but I, <laughs> you always get one. But it also makes me think of what Sean was teaching, too, about acknowledging the places in us, in our own minds and hearts, that diss people or take a certain perverse pleasure in being hateful sometimes or just carry um, a lot of the pain that, we, that has been projected onto us or given to us in our upbringing. And that it's so much easier to project all of that onto Trump and make Trump the source of our problems instead of really owning our own shadow or our own difficulties in the areas. Yeah, maybe we're not sending tweets, but we're thinking them. But, but, but you also, what must it be like? You know, I couldn't imagine it to, you know, carry whatever you want to call it, malignant narcissism. That's hard. I think that's hard to be that, I think. That's that homeboy, you know, we don't get tripped up by behavior because you're surrounded by bad behavior, you know. <laughs> you know, guys will just throw down, okay, we don't do that here, and sit them down, and what's going on? And, and gang violence, all violence, is a language. What language is it speaking? That's what you want to know. You want to... A uh, homie the other day says, how do we get underneath so we know where the thorn is? Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty good. But that's what it is. You're reacting to outrageous behavior. We don't do this here, zero tolerance. We don't really do that. Because it's about the thorn. Find the thorn. And then people know that. And then they do it with tenderness. And, and, and that's the only spirit that, that can change the world, you know? If you're, if you're constantly ventilating with tenderness, then you're at a, at a different place. People are feeling less ashamed. And it's only tenderness that can get folks to feel less far away. Right. And that's how you want to, you know, be in the world. And I just... We have a confidence in this room, I think, that that in the end is going to win. That in the end will alter things. That in the end will shape how we see unshakable goodness in each other. And there are no exceptions to that. And how do we help people in health have access to their unshakable goodness? Jimmy Carter, Donald Trump, both share it. But not everybody has access to it. How do we help each other? Of course, the problem is it's a consequential thing, you know, like um, because he is the president of the United States. <laughs> but, a, but apart from that, you know, how do we help people find their truth, you know? I loved when Pope Francis talked about a revolution of tenderness. That's right. Remember that talk? Yeah. Was that his uh, TED, uh, TED talk? Yeah. He also said there uh, that the only world worth building is a world that includes everyone. That's pretty good stuff. Yeah. I just met him uh, in November. What's he like? 
Well, you know, at all the home, I, I would tell the homies, I'd send a picture of me shaking hands with the Pope, and I'd say, he wished you happy birthday. I would say things like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kiwole, Kiwole is kind of a greeting among Latino gang members. I said, the Pope says, hey, tell Jaime, Kiwole, you know. <laughs> well, of course, it's preposterous, and they'd go, Really? He mentioned me? <laughs> and then I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to retreat. I said, yeah. So it was like 200 people, mainly Jesuits, all these folks. We were at a conference. Um, so, you know, you go up, and, and he's so present, and he's so gentle, and he's just the smile won't leave. And I said whatever I said, you know. In Spanish, I said, thank you for your leadership, you know. And he just smiled broadly, and I suppose it was me, but it sounded like he said, next, you know, but <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. That was, I'm sure that was my own insecurity, but, but it was funny to keep sending him to homies, you know, and, uh, or, or bringing it back up when, because I try to remember birthdays, and I said, here he is wishing you, saying, I'm glad he was born, you know. I mean, it's preposterous on one level, but the fact that they were so gullible on another level <laughs> means how much they wanted was to hear kind it. of quaint, you yeah. know. What about the role of prayer and meditation in your spiritual life? You are busy, so you have so much work. Do you? Make time? Do you do retreat? What do you do? I do, and I, uh, I get up impossibly early at 3 in the morning, so, and so I try to kind of be faithful enough to not just my practice, but it's kind of the time when I'll do emails and I'll do all sorts of things, but it's my, my kind of my favorite time, you know. And I would agree, you know, with the Dalai Lama that it's hard. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but you try, I have my little space, you know, and my little altar and my little ritual. And so I try to stay faithful to it because you, you fall for stuff if you don't, you know. And it, it kind of gives you an ability to catch yourself all day long because... Do you mean you fall for stuff in your own mind? Yeah, you fall own, for yeah. You, you, you'll fall for stuff if you're not anchored in that moment that begins your day. Uh, occasionally, we'll try to do it also uh, at a second part in my day, but that's not always easy just because the day gets ahead of you. But if you can catch yourself in the course of the day, and that's your touchstone, you know. Uh, but the homies have gotten quite good at their own practice, you know, and we have lots of varieties of, of that invitation to them uh, daily, you know, mm -hmm. and multiple times mm -hmm. a day. So a lot of variety, different places on our campus, and, and it's helpful, you know, obviously. But that's kind of my practice. Yeah, thank you. What time do you go to sleep? Yeah, I try to go to bed early, which aggravates a lot of people because I'm, I'm kind of like that senior citizen dinner hour, you know, kind of. The early bird. Uh, early bird, yeah. Yeah. I do the best I can. I try to catch up when I can. I feel so blessed for all of us to sit here together with you. Thank you. No, it was my yeah. privilege. When I grow up, I want to be like Father G. <laughs> <laughs> I was really struck when you said that um, self-absorption is the place of sadness, because I've always thought of it as self-absorption is 
or being just encapsulated in our thought world is the place of loneliness. But that's a sad place to be lonely and to be sad and to be completely uh, identified with our thoughts. And it's such a weird thing. I mean, you know, we say we have the flu. We don't say I am the flu, <laughs> right? But we say I am angry as though I... And then I identify I'm an angry person. Then it goes into the self-absorbed world. Um, and I think so much of what we're trying to do in our practice is emerge from that world. And I, I just really appreciated when you said it's the place of sadness because then why wouldn't we want to emerge from that world instead of just because we think it's selfish? It's a little bit like if you, I fly a lot, so if you, if you pay attention, I always do this as a practice of mine, as in when I walk through the door when I'm boarding the plane, and people have talked about this before, where you say hi to the flight attendants, which is... But you watch people, you know, and it's like that's kind of the self-absorption. It's not that people are selfish. I don't think that. I think they're self-absorbed. Will I get my bag in the overhead friggin' compartment? That's, that's what they're, they're self-absorbed. Imagine that you have to be told three times, step out of the center aisle. Three times, four times, you go, wow, why is that? That like, feels remarkable to me. It's because we're stuck in a sadness mm -hmm. of self-absorption. That is, how will I, there won't be enough, and how do I get my bag in the overhead compartment? But the minute you stop and catch yourself and say, well, I'm going to be other-centered. So I always have, I always have the um, aisle seat. And I don't do anything. I don't do my phone. I wait, you know, for the old person who's going to need to get... It's not like being good. It's I know that that takes me to this other place. And, and suddenly I'm not sad. Does it always work? It always works. Mm -hmm. And where you're just kind of, oh, here, let me do that for you. You know, whatever it is, because planes are dicey kind of places, you know, and, and you're just irritated at the gate, you know. <laughs> but then you're th you bring this intentionality that once you move beyond, I'm going to help somebody you know, put their bag up or whatever. Then you move to, and I'm going to choose right now to love being loving. Now, having said that, I'm an introvert, so I'm not going to have a conversation. I don't really do that. I'll, I'll have my book. But at least when we're boarding, I force myself to be kind of this other way that's easier to do at my office with gang members than it is with fellow travelers on a plane. <laughs> but that's where I kind of, because otherwise you have to say, this is a bad person because he's standing in the aisle. Doesn't he see he's got 43 people behind him? No, he's stuck, and we're all stuck, stuck. in a kind of a self-absorbed sadness that we can help each other out of and point beyond ourselves to this other place of initial happiness and eventual joy. And so it's kind of a paradigm of how we are in the world. But we get stuck the minute we just say, this is a bad person who is selfish and not thinking about all the people. But then when, at, at Homeboy we talk about Mysticism. We, we say that mysticism is our core competency because it's seeing the wholeness of people, that you want to have this mystical fluency. So the title of my next book, which I haven't written yet, <laughs> but I do have a title that my agent and my editor and my publisher at Simon Schuster, all three hate it, so it's... It's a good one. I think I'm on to something. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
And, and it comes from, I, I was helping, a, uh, I was testifying for a, a homie that I've known for a while, mainly from being locked up, and, and he was being, uh, they wanted to deport him after 10 years in prison to Uzbekistan. And he came here with his mother at like nine years old. And they landed on the east side, and this kid at nine years old, you know, grew up uh, near this Latino gang and got into a Latino gang. And so somehow the family said, can you come and testify so they don't deport him? And they didn't. So I came back to the office after having gone to the federal building to testify on his behalf. And I see this guy, Louie, and I know they're from the same gang. I said, hey, do you know this guy, David? And I say his name. Oh, that's my dog right there, you know, which is a good thing. <laughs> and he said, we call him Russian boy. In fact, we were cellies and, uh, at county jail, men's central jail. And every night, he'd walk out into the, to the hallway and he'd get on the payphone and he spoke Russian to his mother. Then he looks at me and he says, damn, gee, he spoke the whole language. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the title of my next book. The whole language, the power of extravagant tenderness. Mm. Because that's the mystical view, is to see wholeness. And, and at Homeboy, among the staff and everybody there, you want to go, how can you see what's wholly there rather than, you know, he's bad and he doesn't belong here and he's not cooperating or whatever it is. But how do you get underneath and find the thorn? And, and part of the mystical core competency is an ability to be tender, which is the connective tissue that unless love becomes that, you know, endearments, word and gesture, the forgotten dialect of the heart, unless it becomes that, then love stays, you know, in the air or even in our heart, but it doesn't become what it has to become, which is tender and connective, where you see the wholeness. That's all a mystic does is sees this entirety. And so I, I, I don't have a book yet, but I, the whole language for me feels like, what if we were fluent in that? What if we spoke the whole language with each other, you know? One of the last times that we were with visiting Ramdas in Hawaii, where we just came from a couple of days ago, um, there was a visit from Roland Fisher, I think his name is, who um, is doing the psilocybin Griffin. research. Roland Griffin. Roland Griffin, who's doing the psilocybin research at uh, Johns Hopkins and working with people who are um, working with people who are dealing with addiction, those who are in the middle of cancer treatment or close to death, a whole variety. Um, and they were kind of sharing, Ramdas was talking about the earliest years of psychedelic research and so forth before he got kicked out of Harvard and things like that. And, uh, uh, and then um, Roland said, you know, um, we get remarkable results from this. People who've been depressed for a long time kick out of their depression in another way, or people who are close to dying with a, who have a great deal of fear and anxiety, that drops away. He said, and the main thing that changes people, they have all their scales because they're doing his research, he says, if they have a mystical experience, then everything changes. It's like Thomas Merton walking down the street in Louisville and seeing the secret beauty of everybody That's walking right. by. And if they have that, even for a moment, he said, then everything's good. And I'm listening to you thinking, this is the, this is the, the vision that homeboy somehow, when you walk in, 
invites for people to see. Yeah. Um, and then I guess we're invited to see each other in that way. We don't, I mean, you could go to Homeboys. I would recommend it, actually. That would be a good thing. But um, you could also do it on the airplane, apparently. <laughs> you know, and walking down the street and seeing the secret beauty of one another. And maybe that's all that matters, as you're saying. Well, maybe we should let, um, invite other people who might have a question it's for... It's uh, 10.05. So, do we um, have 10 um, minutes? What? I won't remember. Oh, you want to do that. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Remember? Okay. Then it's time think? to do that. <coughs> that thing that you want right? to do. I do. Well, that's what we, yes. Um, I wanted to do a little ritual um, before we end, and I want to need the help of a few people in the front row, because I we've just got 10 more minutes. I'd like us to create for anyone who wants, quite optional, what are called blessing cords or protection cords. So I need some people to come up and just put clumps of these around the room and then people will pass them to one another. Um, here's another bunch of them. Give them in clumps to others and here's some more. And here's some more. And I'll talk about them a little bit um, as you do. Yeah, just give them, then they'll pass them down the row any way you like. There are also some gold ones if you're desperate. You can have those kind. So w while they're being passed out, I want to talk about them a little bit. Um, and you don't have to give them out one by one. You can just give a, give a bunch of them to somebody, and then they'll pass they them down pass the row. Them. Yeah. They'll pass them to others. So they're called blessing or protection cords. Um, and the reason that, that they're done in this way, there are a couple of things. One is that symbolically, in, across most of uh, Asia, um, the cord or the thread is used as part of a sacred ritual of all kinds, healing, blessings, marriage, other things, um, in, um, as a symbol. as a symbol of Oops. the thread that we are in the web of life itself, that we're just one thread in the warp and waft of, of life itself. And so it's a symbol that you're woven with everyone else around you. And then the reason it's this color, although there are others as a golden color as well, um, is it's considered to be one thread from the robe, uh, from the sacred garments, from the robe of a monk or nun, and so forth. So when you go in the marketplace, you're really wearing your robes. You're a monk or nun in drag, basically. You know, going, looking like a, an ordinary person, but your home is actually in that mystical ground. Um, and for us to do these, we have to. There's a there's a little process that we have to go through. In Buddhist tradition, um, it's. Uh, in, in Zen, you sit at the beginning of your sitting and you take the bodhisattva vow, um, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. But you get in trouble with that when you go home because the people you live with don't want to be saved by you, right? <laughs> so it has to have another meaning, or the homies, whoever, they don't want to be saved by you. And really what it means is setting the compass of your heart um, in a direction um, that is where you want to be, where, how you want to use this life for yourself. Um, so when the Dalai Lama wakes up in the morning um, and takes his seat in meditation, he says, he has this beautiful vow from Shantideva that may I be a bridge, a boat, a raft um, to help all cross the stream. May I be medicine for the sick and food for the hungry. May I be a resting place for the weary. May I be a lamp for those lost in darkness so that we all awaken together as long as earth and sky and galaxies exist until all are liberated. Some little vow like that. <laughs> um, there's a modern version of it that I love that comes from Diane Ackerman where she writes, in the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning, and the wayfaring moon, and the night when it departs. I swear I will not dishonor my soul 
with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, a healer of misery, a messenger of wonder, and an architect of peace. So to make these chords, I want to ask you to close your eyes for a moment and get quiet. And if you were to make, to set an intention for your heart, a vow, if you will, like the Bodhisattva vow that the Dalai Lama takes, it doesn't have to be so complicated or poetic. It could be, I vow to be kind. I vow to see the beauty in every being, the secret beauty behind the eyes of every being I meet. Oh, beautiful. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> wow. And then finally, that's, that's a blessing. Let yourself sit quietly just for a minute. And, and take into yourself um, the blessings of the day. What you've heard, what touched you, what reminded you of what you already know. I want to thank Father Greg so much for your generosity and kindness to come here.